Hello, this is your host, Todd Lewis, the President of Folly Podcast. Joined again by Logos and Andrew Sotelites. This is the sixth of our Plato discussion, part one of the Cradleus. So the Cradleus is the dialogue where, where Socrates is, or Plato rather, is trying to get in, uh, dealing with the issue of are there any meanings behind words that are like intrinsic or are words just labels we slap onto things? So the three main characters are, of course, Socrates, who's talking to the two interlocutors. Hermogenes, who is a conventionalist and believes names are just conventions we assign to things. And you could you could literally call something by the opposite name. You, know, uh, you could call a horse a man and a man a horse, and it doesn't matter because it's just what we conventionally give people. You know, items and things, and then Kratos is like, "Well, well, no, you know, he's a naturalist. He thinks that you have to have names that at least point to or represent or are a reflection of an underlying truth." And so that's sort of how this gets set up. One also a big picture uh, meta issue is, I, I, well. Over the last century, apparently, there's been some dispute over whether the etymologies in the middle of the book are meant to be taken seriously. What I think is problematic with that is that this is, again, a modern interpretation, which smacks of deconstructionism to me. And earlier philosophers, not even Platonists, for example, Aristotle, took this as a serious diving into the etymologies of these words. Uh, one interesting theory is that this is sort of like Plato's thesaurus, where he defines all of these words so that when you read the rest of the dialogues, you should read those words as he's describing them etymologically in the Cradleus, which is an interesting thing uh, to, to, to contemplate how it would to tie that together and make it a more serious reading of it. So the the modernity in the modern scholarship is a debate, is it a joke or is it to be taken seriously? Uh, if it's to be taken seriously, how might one do that? One way you could do that is treating it as kind of like a Plato's thesaurus. <laughs> but with uh, at the beginning of the dialogue, though, uh, Hermogenes says to, you know, Plato, or Socrates rather, Hey, you know, Cradleus is being really annoying. He's he's talking about naturalism, but I mean, you know, different countries, uh, different nations and races have different names for the same thing. Doesn't that just mean it's all convention? And that leads into a the first part of the dialogue, which is basically Plato Socr through Socrates demonstrating to Hermogenes that uh, conventionalism is false. And he begins by saying, well, do you, do you believe that, you know, a good man is bad and a bad man is good? And Hermogenes is like, well, no, I don't believe that. That's ridiculous. And, Pla and Socrates is like, well, yeah, of course. So then why would that be true for any other slap up of words that you choose to use? And you can't just have words for you know, private usage and, and not anyone else because then they become useless and disassociated. So that's sort of uh, some introductory material for the dialogue and for the first part where Socrates and Hermogenes are squaring off. Logos, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, this dialogue is very, very confusing, which is why it's taken me longer to read it even than the Phaedo, which as we saw in the Phaedo, we had like arguments within arguments and meta narratives about uh, Heraclitus and Parmenides and all sorts of stuff going on under the hood. This, I'm not getting a sense that there's some like underlying parody of a debater, other other class of arguments going on. This is just a straightforward argument, but it's just not an easy one to untangle. So some problems that modern philosophers are really pointing out with language here. Well, here's some examples that the, the first part that you're talking about made me think of, right? So one thing uh, that we can think of with names is proper names, which is uh, a topic in modal logic and possible world. So like Todd, for example, uh, suppose there's a possible world in which everything else happened exactly as it happens, except uh, your parents named you, I don't know, Steve instead of Todd, right? So we're still having this conversation, that possible world, but whenever I refer to you as Todd, uh, instead, I refer to you as Steve, but nothing else in that world changes. Nothing about a relationship or politics or anything. It's, you're just Steve instead of Todd. Uh, what are the philosophical implications of that? So, so one position you could take is that a thing is just like its ontological composition. 
And do you take the Shakespearean notion that a rose by any other name is still a rose, right? And so by accident, things could be called, you know, accidents of history and language and culture and so on. Things could have different uh, names about them. But as long as the names are still pointing to the same underlying thing, um, no harm, no foul, as long as everybody figures out, you know, what everybody's talking about. Um, but there, there's some other debates about, you know, like I read the Wikipedia article about um, counterpart theory and proper names and all that stuff. And wow, there are some really deep modal semantical debates about that and truth semantics. It's, it's, it's nasty. It's like way more complicated than this dialogue even. Everybody makes good points in that argument. So it's just fun to think about. Uh, another thing that I thought about when reading this first part of the dialogue that is kind of being brushed over with a coat of paint is um, something in philosophy we call intentionality with an S, not a T, not intent, but like tension but intention. Um, and what that is, is a weird philosophical concept where uh, it might be true in some objective sense that certain substitutions can be made, but uh, certain people may or may not be privy to the truth of those substitutions. And so you can fundamentally change uh, meaning or truth in a proposition, even if you make a, a logically legal substitution. So a classic example of this would be something like uh, Superman is Clark Kent. And so if, you know, anybody who knows that Superman is Clark Kent could be just fine substituting one for the other one in any proposition. They'd be like, oh, yeah, we're talking about the same guy. But somebody who doesn't know that Superman is Clark Kent would hear that, and, you know, if you try to substitute Clark for Superman, you know, Superman was on a uh, on report for the Daily Planet. They'd be beside themselves. We mean, Superman works the Daily Planet. He doesn't work for anybody. Who, nobody even knows where he lives. How do you know he works the Daily Planet? You're nuts. Um and so this is an instance where Clark Kent and Superman being proper names for the same person that exists in space and time and so on uh, pose issues because we don't know uh, that those two are the same individual. Uh, an example that SEP gives would be like, uh, you know, uh, there's my neighbor Ryan and there's Ryan who's Jack the Ripper. So suppose a victim gets away and sees Jack the Ripper's face and they know it as your neighbor Ryan, but you've never seen Ryan that way. And so like, it's, it's all really complicated. Um, so that's another interesting issue that can come up with names and when you can and can't substitute them. Uh, another thing that I thought about reading this is signs versus content. So the first two I brought up were kind of like implicit proper names and intentionality. I figured I'm going to keep note of those because as we work our way through the dialogue, they may come up. Uh, you know, they might sneak on the periphery and I want them like down and thinking about them as we read through it. But this one actually does come up explicitly. And this is like signs versus content. So there's the content of a proposition, like what it's actually referring to could be a flesh and blood thing. We can point to or touch and say this, this is what I'm talking about. And there's just our way of talking about it, the sign or the signifier. And so you could point at a animal and say duck. And the thing you're pointing at is what you're talking about. You use the word duck to talk about it. Somebody else might have a word of their own language pointing at the exact same animal. So we're both referring to the same content, but we're using different words to describe what's going on. And that could be the whole, uh, you know, two different countries have the same name for or a different word for the same name. Well, if they're truly re referring to the same object, they just have a word in different language. What's the problem with that? Even Socrates has to, you know, accept that different languages have different words for things. And he admits as much later in the dialogue when he says that um, uh, different cultures might fashion different names out of things like blacksmiths might make diff, you know different looking hammers different shaped hammers hammers that are different materials because they have what's available but they're still kind of approximating the same tool for the same function and so that's one layer to the debate um another one would be like names the utility of language so names serve a functional purpose in language in that they're, they're meant to denote relationships between objects so for example um i can ride a horse but if I told you that I wrote a rose, you might look at me with raised eyebrows. You know, a rose is a tiny little flower. How are you going to write a rose, right? And so if I was just to be swapping around the word horse with the word rose, we'd have a problem because roses are tiny little flowers that you pick and you put in bouquets and, and so on. There's a whole class of functional relationships we have between roses and other people and events and things. And likewise, the ones with horses and people and events and things. So people can ride horses. So there's a writing relationship between the two that doesn't exist for roses and so swapping them uh, causes needless confusion and swapping their relationships and a large part of the dialogue is going to focus on this but after reading it further it turns out not as much as i thought um and then finally the last one that i didn't have written down in my notes 
I found this literally just before you sent me the link and I got on. It's just the the discussion of universals. So universals and categories. So universals and categories have proper names, not in a nominal sense, but in a purely structural sense as far as universals right into their universals. So for example, uh, the sign two that we could write on a piece of paper or the word two or dos or toi or you know whatever you would say in another language for two, those are all nominally different, but they point to the same universal structure, i.e. the structure between one and three, if we want to get cheeky about it. Um, and so it's more than just a, a, a functional idea of meaning in terms of relationships and things like that, but also the discussion of universals becomes relevant as another layer of language. So we've got all of these like A, B, C, D, five layers of language, right? That, that we have that we have to think about when we're talking about whether you can swap words and names and whatnot for terms. And because this is kind of like an ancient philosophy text, philosophy hasn't evolved to the point where it has to stay, where we can like keep all these in our head straight and really like focus on the dialogue and um, figure out what's what. And so one of the reasons why it's taken me so long and I'm so far behind you in reading this, Todd, is because I've been trying to like look at all the different arguments in this dialogue through each of these five different frames of reference to see like what's being argued for, what's not being argued for, do the arguments work in this frame but not in this other one, are there subtle conflations being made between two things as we found out when we discussed the Fado? And so I've been kind of being very careful in going over the first few arguments and that's about as far as I've got. But uh, yeah, that's that's my first little rant on what I've seen in the first part. All right, uh, Andrew. Yeah, so uh, the thing that stood out to me that uh, no one's touched on yet is basically there there are two parts that are and logos talked a little bit about things adjacent to this is there's a discussion of like the actual signifier right that it's king in english and rex in latin right and conceptually they're the same thing and they're both referring to the same thing but there's this additional layer that he goes into uh, when he starts talking about these analogies with the, the names of the gods, where there's this conceptual network associated with like Apollo, right? And Apollo is the healer and the cleaner and the one that makes things go in an ordered way. And there's this like conceptual web. And both of these are tied to language, and and the, they they have this discussion of basically that the exact language is sort of like the material that the underlying concepts get made out of. So, like in barbarian language, it's king, and in Greek or in Latin, it's rex, and so on and so forth. And uh, the other thing that really stuck out to me is he talked about how. Some names are more correct than others, but like the names the gods call themselves aren't known to us. And but it's entirely acceptable and good for us to know the best use the best words that we we can to to describe these things. And so basically, basically, he seems to be uh, uh, the, the the thing described in the the dialogue seems to be this very nuanced perspective, which is both anti-nominalist, right? He's not claiming that these knowledge webs don't have any underlying reality and, and that they are like related to universals, but also fundamentally that we're very constrained and limited in what we can actually know, right? And that sometimes we can actually know the true names of things, but oftentimes we don't, and we're just using what we know from tradition and the wisest humans, but, the, but they're not the same. Um, and, and I think this is a really key insight uh, because if you actually look at the development of like language, myth, and symbology across cultures, there are some things that cluster really closely together, but then there are other things that vary, right? Like uh, a good example is the concepts of what's associated with femininity and masculinity in like Chinese culture is different than what's uh, in American culture. Or, or in European culture, like uh, I believe winter is considered feminine in in Chinese culture, while in in European culture, uh, winter is usually considered sort of masculine, right? 
And and th that's part of the discussion is not only like the sign problem, but a discussion of these underlying semantic webs of meaning and association and symbology. Right. So some of the points that Socrates brings up in his discussion with Hermogenes uh, is the idea, they go in this extended discourse about tools and the person who uses tools and that the person who, you know, uses the tool determines the tool's use. Where, where I've talked about this a lot before with Ivan Illich and other contexts, but he mentions how uh, making words is like using a shuttle on a loom and that uh, he calls these uh, people who call things by their correct names rule setters or name makers. And using an analogy to a blacksmith who works with metal, they work with words. And what makes a, a name a good name or uh, a, is, is a name that, well, first of all, names separate. So in the, in the same, so the purpose of a word maker is to separate things from other things at a conceptual level in an analogous way that a butcher separates one flank from another by cutting it with a knife. And so what makes a good word maker a good word maker? Well, if those separations and those identifications that he makes map nearly or completely with the underlying formal structure of reality. So if you if you do that correctly by making the right cuts, so to speak, and having the right names represent the right things and point to the right things, then that's a good word maker as opposed to a, a bad word maker. And so we also see that with words, you could have an etymology of a, of a thing that leads to multiple meanings. And as long as those meanings are not exclusive, uh, they can be seen as complementary. Uh, he goes on, the, he talks about the sun in one case, where that's the case. And so there's this idea that, that you know, good words ought to point to something that's true, that's the underlying reality of things. Um, and so obviously I'm very sympathetic to the naturalist position and that, which is based and the conventional position is not based. And one of the problems we see practically with this, this sort of conventionalist attitude to language is in the modern West where we literally are at the point where we can't even agree between two people on the same side of a political dispute on what the word means. Uh, I, I, Keith and I were on a, debate last year with some socialists and the two socialists couldn't even agree on what the definition of socialism was so keith and i are left scratching our heads like well what exactly are we debating here like we both agreed on this historic definition of socialism and we're, we're debating that and they're both and they're both like well we reject that and then we have our own subject dependent definitions of socialism and i'm like well well that, that the whole debate becomes impossible because we don't even know what we're talking about and I don't know if Plato gets into this later on, but the the obvious error and flaw of conventionalism is that it literally makes discourse impossible. And of course, the only point in having a language is to be able to effectively communicate via words one set of ideas from one person to another person. If you can't do that, then that's literally not the point of language. It, it, it's pointless. And we, we see this, you know, just accelerated up to the present day and discourse becomes nearly impossible. And then the problem is, well, then how do you get people to agree on terms again? Well, that's a problem that Plato didn't tackle here. But um, as to your point, Logos, about some of the distinctions you made about how words were used, I think, I think you're right about where you said that, you know, you had multiple different signs, but they're all pointing to the same thing that would represent the different languages, the different nations. And and you see, that's not the kind of radical epistemic uncertainty that Hermogenes thinks it is, right? Because we all really know, we all really mean the same thing when we say, you know, one or, you know, eins or uno. We know what that means. It's not like, you know, having three different names, you know, mixing and matching all these different names that don't mean anything. So there's like within one language family, you have a word that points to something and maybe a synonym that points to the same thing. And then you might have outside of that language family, another language, which also points to the same thing. And that word has a different etymological root, but it's not convention 
Ism, because we're still both pointing to the same thing. You could have a good word maker, say, using Persian, who's making the same cuts the Greek does, but he's making them within his own specific contingent context. Whereas the, the third thing that I just described, the radical epistemic uncertainty and language breakdown we have today, is because even within the same language family, people are just mixing and matching things ad nauseum, which leads to a complete impasse. Uh, so logos. Yeah, and I think I think this gets to the one of the real hearts of the the dialogue, what it is and what it isn't. Uh, like I said before, Socrates agrees with you, Todd, that uh, he's not trying to um, make a problem the idea that different languages have different words for the same thing they're trying to convey using the the metaphor of the blacksmiths making different hammers of different materials so that was dispensed with pretty quickly which is good because that's clear to the conversation um the other layer i think that needs to be addressed is hmm okay so let me see if i can give a practical idea of where conventionalism might have a point uh so let's look at mathematics for example so a long time ago um uh, you look at i the symbol i i squared equals negative one or i equals a square root of negative one and mathematicians used to call that imaginary numbers as like a pejorative right that was their name for them because you'll never see them in reality and so on and so forth well turns out there actually weren't a lot of real applications for these numbers they show up everywhere we need to model like cyclical patterns and things like that and so well i mean if these things really are corresponding to very real properties and, and structures and relationships in the world, uh, does the name imaginary fit anymore? It's like, well, no, we're going to call them complex numbers now because um, they behave in some ways that we wouldn't expect numbers to behave, but they behave in more complicated ways the way we need numbers to behave in certain situations. And so now more modern textbooks will refer to them as complex numbers with a script C, the complex plane, instead of imaginary numbers, which is what the original I might have represented. Um, and so now you could have, you know, two mathematicians arguing about this. So some might say, well, no, I, I think the name of matchery is perfectly good because ontologically speaking, right. Uh, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get a negative area by, by squaring, uh, lengths or something like that. And somebody else will say, yeah, well, we're not referring to area. We're referring to something more complex. And so we're gonna call it this. And so that's a, a pretty good non-trivial debate you could have over, how to name this particular thing based on its uses in different contexts and so on. And I know that what you're, you're getting at is some of the more arbitrary things that societies come, come up with to argue about, like socialism or something else. But this is a really re this is a real case where I think that that debate is actually worth having. And so I am kind of like sympathetic to it, even though, you know, I got to agree at some level with my boy Plato and form with forms and universals. Uh, and so this is one of the things I'm torn about on this particular dialogue. Well, I just want to, yeah, I also want to add real quick to what you just said there. Um, as far as where where does conventionalism fit in, if it fits in at all? Well, I think one way you could argue is that, well, you know, Greek versus Persian. Uh, obviously, you know, those are two different languages. And so the fact that somebody living in Persepolis would use Persian to describe, say, a tree different than what Plato would use doesn't necessarily you could say that that's convention in the sense that he grew up within that language convention but that doesn't mean conventional in the sense of a label disassociated from any meaningful connection with what underlies it uh andrew thoughts yeah so i guess and this is sort of an implicit theme that i might be reading into it is that functionally we have to be conventionalists because of our limits of knowledge right and that 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 is basically the only way that you can communicate effectively. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't also try to name things properly. And I think that's that's sort of the combination of the two positions that 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 gets synthesized in the dialogue, at least from my reading. Right. Yeah. Because on the one hand, you know, as you mentioned with that little bit about the naming of the gods, even their true name is known only to them, right? Because humans have various limiting factors that would prevent them from properly understanding uh, what what the names of the gods are. And of course, you know, unless you inhabited the realm of the forms you in, or were able to in, uh, apprehend them directly through the intellect, you, you wouldn't be able to know their names. So we, we do, there is, 
there is an attempt to correctly identify something, but not completely identify something, right? So we could say that, and without having to go to the level of the forms, you know, we could talk about somebody saying, well, there, there's, a, there's a tree down the road, which is, you know, maybe technically correct, but it turns out maybe it's a, it's a oak tree. And maybe it's also, you know, it's shedding its leaves because it's in fall. And so while it's a correct naming of it, it's just correct in a very general, vague sense. And you could have a more correct, more precise name for that thing, um, which could be, you know, acquired later on. And I think that we could say that that, that process of refining the clarity, because also this gets to your question of refinement as well, Logos. Uh, what do we call it, imaginary numbers or complex numbers? It's that process of refining. Because if you make it too, if you, as you make it more precise, you exclude more, and so now that name becomes more of an umbrella for a category of concepts rather than just one simple idea. And you keep going down that way, it gets more and more complicated. It sounds like what you guys are saying is convention lies in that part of the naming process. Is that what you'd say, Logos? Um, I would say, well, we're talking about Plato, but I think I'm going to channel my boy Veblen here for a second. <laughs> I can't help myself. Um, Veblen would uh, think of names as, as institutions or conventional wisdom. And so names uh, signify as much as a people's relationship two concepts and things as they can convey about the things themselves and so going back to the 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 number example right people in the renaissance and in greece would be very very happy to call uh i an imaginary number because they're very much concerned with tangible things like volumes and areas and so on and so insofar as i is kind of a nuisance in solving the problems they're trying to solve these real physical tangible things um they would know it as imaginary and it took mathematicians a very long time to talk about like cyclical algebraic structures and things like Fourier series and things like that, which which model like waves and and cyclical things you can't talk about in the same concrete physical way. Um, and so, so you need those structures for these other things that you didn't before. And so it's 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 in some sense the 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 use of the concept that dictates what is and isn't a proper name for the concept. And so. Some sympathy I have for conventionalism is what is or isn't useful can be an accident of some circumstances, circumstances of other ideas. There's some there's some ideas that society A could associate and things they couldn't, um, or physical circumstances. We know how to work with waves, and so we need to, to, to model them for radio communications and things like that, electricity, um, whereas the Greeks were concerned with quantities and areas and things like that. Um, and so certain types of accidents, in a modal sense, we can conceive of possible worlds where societies develop differently, or just just senses of of history like you talk about you know society a is at this level of development society b is at this other level of development um that'll dictate kind of the convention behind uh why words have some names and associations and other words don't have names and associations and this will come back to the intentionality problem that i mentioned earlier in philosophy where certain kinds of substitutions would make sense logically if everybody knows better but because there are lots of instances where people don't people balk at certain substitutions and that makes a lot of complication all right Andrew. yeah uh, and i think that the key point is the associations right because the actual sign to the concept is relatively easy to manage but but to use an example from our own language what's the difference between a king and a president right because if if you take you know your favorite Dispot of some um, small country in a undeveloped part of the world, they can be a president or they can be a king, and they function very similarly. And both of those have a huge set of different connotations for us, and they would possibly have very different connotations for like a Roman. Um, and and that that's the type of things that are harder to navigate rather than than the actual just specific sign usage. Well, another good way to illustrate your point, Andrew, is dictator in the Roman context was a good thing. A, a dictator was a positive role, was an emergency figure in the Republic. 
Whereas in modern Western political discourse, dictator universally means a usurper and a terrible bad person that took power and is holding it against the will of the people. Whereas a dictator in the Roman sense was actually a constitutional office for emergencies. So we see how that word is still used in a political context, but it means something totally different uh, between those contexts. Now, you know, you you would mention logos earlier. This idea about you know, just naming conventions. Like, what if what if there was another parallel, you know, alternate uh, uh, other world, alternate world, exactly like ours, except where I'm named Steve or something. And like, what if we envision you know, uh, an alternate world where you know Andrew is named Todd, or or an alternate world where some guy named Todd gives the purple haired feminist money. Like you know, obviously those two things aren't me. So, yeah, I, I think that a, a radical uh, conventionalism is, is completely disastrous. Yeah, I mean, it just basically uh, makes everything a sophistical uh, uh, competition, right? Yeah. Yeah, another good way of putting this for the audience as well is... I, I, as I've been thinking about this conversation is the Rosetta stone, right? So the idea is if you want to convert from one language to another language, you might want to have some basic idea about what the, some basic words that the alphabets and symbols mean. And then what you can do is practice putting together the basic words and the more complex words. And so you can figure out how you can translate one thing from one language to another language. And so if I don't know, horse in Egyptian is different from horse in Greek, well, you can kind of put things together to figure it out um, uh, between the two languages and use a Rosetta Stone to communicate, you know, take the, you know, reconstruct one into the other via their their very basic concepts. Uh, the real issue, I think we all agree that the, the real issue happens when people take words that have known associations and they usurp them with completely different words with completely different associations for no real tangible benefit except to muddy the water in the conversation. Um, and I think a good thing, a good way to help clean up this dialogue is instead of talking about like proper usage and and uh, Plato talks about like um, I forget the exact word he used uses, but he talks about like the ends of nature and. Instead of thinking about things as, as proper ends or, you know, things that some ultimate giver assigns things, uh, just for sake of clarity for a more general audience, let's just just, just talk about things in, in terms of it, is the way you're using a word adding clarity or is it adding uh, muddiness to the conversation? Like, what in what way is your use of a word making things more clear? And in what way is your use of a word making, you know, words garbled together so we have to, like, add a bunch of extra, you know, transitions to make things make sense. Uh, a good way of putting this might just be like, uh, if I have to go through a bunch of extra steps to translate your word usage from ordinary word usage, uh, you should be able to tell me what I'm getting out of these extra translative steps. Otherwise, you're just making me do a bunch of, you know, menial tasks inside my head for nothing. And you're just giving me a headache to pat yourself on the back. Right. It's like that video you showed me, Todd, about the, the demon of menial tasks or whatever that video was. Right. It's a language version of that. If you're using a bunch of words in a weird way that have to run this through this mental decoder, that's a bunch of menial, menial tasks to translate words to words just so I can understand what you're saying. But I haven't got anything out of it. You're just you're just wasting time and energy. Yeah, yeah, you're not you're not really helping to advance the discussion, um, Andrew. Yeah, and the thing that, that hasn't come up in the dialogue yet uh, is actually how we can discover these true true things, right? He gives some he gives some examples of things like we can look to the wise, we should look to the lawmakers and things that have been passed down uh, in order to understand these things, but he doesn't give as far as I recall, a description of how we can actually see these things for for, for themselves, right? It's all, all based sort of on verbal stuff so far, um, which is an interesting point, right? And 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 one of the things where it's again we're sort of functionally um, conventionalists if we're limited to doing things solely that way. Well, yeah, you'd you'd have to somehow reach behind the veil to get to some more true source of knowledge 
Um, what I think is interesting, right, is Plato sets this up by saying that the wordsmith, for lack of a better word, you know, cuts things in order to separate ideas. But the way Platonic philosophy develops is everything is one. <laughs> everything is one. And so what is there actually to divide? It, it, it seems interesting that with this strong pre pressure for, you know, dividing things, classifying things, separating things, Platonic philosophy later develops the idea that, no, everything's just one. And in fact, the divisions are all bad. They need to be effaced by returning back to the one. Uh, Andrew. Yeah, and and the, this this sort of gets into the, the more difficult parts of the dialogue, right? Where the the point is not at the surface level, and I don't have a really good answer on that, right? Because I come from from sort of this Neoplatonic background more so than than the the deep Platonic one, and a Christian one at that, um, and that that. Yeah, that, that's a hard one. The other thing that's interesting, and, and I think some people have jumped on this as far as trying to interpret this as more of a joke, is he mentions Euthyphro, and he says that he's possessed by the muse of Euthyphro. So, so how do you read that, Logos? Uh, well... I mean, it could be hearkening back to the dialogue in that I, I think what he's talking about here is one of the central aims of the platonic dialogue so far, whether it's Euthyphro, whether it's um, – what's the one we did right after Euthyphro, which was talking about uh, the laws and just laws and, you know, do we listen to the majority? Do we listen to the, the, the wise? Phaedo. No, no, no. Before the Phaedo. It was, oh, it was the a, Credo. Yeah, I think it was – yeah, okay. Yeah, it was Credo. Yeah, like every dialogue we've talked about has been an analysis of, of, of words and how to distinguish concepts from one another. So when you're talking about piety, well, what's piety? We're trying to give a good definition of piety. Plato's whole point is piety can't just be whatever you want piety to be because that just leaves the hole open for tyrants to abuse piety however they want for their own ends. Uh, so th there has to be something worth talking about in the concept or it's not worth talking about at all. Um, likewise, if you're talking about, um, you know, like uh, justice, was justice, you know, the will of democracy? Is justice the will of the wise? Is justice the will of the wise man? Is justice according to one's constant conscience? What is justice? Uh, if we can't figure out what justice is, then appealing to it, while well, I'm doing X because it's just, isn't appealing to anything at all. And so I, I think that this is why I've had this odd interpretation of Plato more than anything, which is uh, that, that rubs me the wrong way. I don't think the Platonic dialogues are really ultimately all about the forms and metaphysics and things like that, even though they play a very central role. I think in that quote, what Plato is getting to is his dialogues are mainly inquisitions about language over and above anything else. And this idea that if we're going to use words in the way that people seem to want to use words, right, this is just, they're appealing to some foundational, primitive, pure thing, right? Don't question me. I'm doing justice, right? Um, if they're to be used in that way, people seem to, in our language, be presupposing these foundational pure things and so when plato's talking about the forms okay let's go with that let's let's see where that leads people want to use words as if they're these pure forms uh, let's investigate them and see where it goes and so some of the absurdities that pop out of his dialogues might be just contradictions in trying to run with that model of language that society around him seems to be using uh but the other part he's leaving to the reader is well what's left because I think more than anything else, Plato's trying to stress there has to be something left, right? Because otherwise, all the, the, the ways we appeal to doing anything at all are meaningless and everything just comes down to brute power, right? Uh, you should let the police arrest this man. They're, they're carrying out justice. Well, look, if saying they're carrying out justice doesn't mean anything, right? If, if, if justice is circular, ill-defined, or, or just whatever the tyrant wants it to mean at the end of the day, what are the police doing? They're just using their power over some citizen. Well, boo, I don't like that. Let's use our power over the police, right? And suddenly everything breaks down. So I think Plato has this political science understanding that society can only function when we have this clear-cut use of language to make clear our intentions and to fully justify our actions. I actually totally agree with that. Before I comment, uh, and... Yeah, um...
the the only thing I would say is I yeah, and I think I think that the sort of sociological things are something missed both in classical sources and and contemporary sources. But I also think that yeah, that the, you can take the language stuff too far, right? Because basically the ac that's what the academic skeptics did. Um, and I think that misses the mark, but it has to be retained. And maybe sort of what we consider Platonism is a overcorrection and forgets about those things. Yeah, because, you know, you made the point, Logos, that if we, we don't have names properly, you know, for things like justice or right and, and, and the use of force and even our intentions, we... Um, we, we, we can't really talk about these things. And the other thing that happens is if we can't clearly define things, either because we don't have the language to do so, or because there are certain external social pressures that make you say, that, that would like disincentivize you from saying it, people then use dog whistles, right? So and so what they'll do instead is they'll 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 advocate for something else other than what they're really advocating for, which then allows them to get what they want. But you see, from the outside, you know, when you engage with this person, you don't necessarily know that that's the case. And even if you do know he's dog whistling, you don't necessarily know what he's dog whistling about. It could be a bunch of whole different things. And so not only does communication break down and become impossible, the being able to have the idea of just plain dealing, you know, well, what do you want? What do I want? Nobody's being honest about what they want. So you, you, political life breaks down. You can't have a polis. Logos. I couldn't for my cursor. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, yeah, the example I gave in the chat would be something like, uh, I'm not anti-immigration. I'm just pro really harsh rent control with the cheeky understanding that some economists think that rent control disincentivizes incentive, you know, investment in more building, which means that you're not going to get more people because there's no housing to fit them all. And so that would be an indirect curb on immigration, right? So that'd be an example of a, of a dog whistle. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think you're exactly right on that. Uh, so, yeah, you can think about that at the, at the policy perspective as, as far as dog whistles. And, and the other thing, too, is just just the more basic one. It's just like just just think about what's going on today with the, with the, with the current politics. Right. Uh, you have two different sides talking about a certain political issue involving needles as uh, justice. Bo both of them are claiming that uh, their, their position is, you know, at base value, the just one. Uh, bodily autonomy on one end or, you know, the common good and protecting your neighbor at the other end, never mind the factual disputes about whether these things work and so on. Uh, let's let's just pretend everything's cut and dry and everything's as it seems. Both people are still calling their side justice. Well, OK, if both sides call their side justice, what does justice really mean? Right. You can't use justice to cut the knot and see who's right because they've both laid claim to things being just. Well, so what Plato's trying to do in some sense is solve the problem. Well, if two people are claiming something is just, and you have to pick one, we have to figure out what justice actually means and see if it corresponds to one over the other one. Uh, I think what we're finding in modern era is good luck with that because things are complicated, but I think that's what Plato was trying to do. All right, Andrew. Yeah, um, and I think for that specific one, the things that, that touch on that, are Plato's discussion in this with the the like analogies and synonyms and talking about all these like conceptual webs? Because one way to approach that sort of conflict is um, uh, you basically have to look for some thing that both of the things in conflict help with, right? So on one end you have bodily autonomy, and then on the other you have uh, the common good. And there's something that both of these are are pointing to that is going to be overall justice, assuming that both of them are actually associated with justice in any way. And and that one if you were able to find that, then you're able to find the mistake, right? And and this is sort of implicit in this dialogue and, and more explicit in Aristotle, that the conceptual webs that underlie reality don't have conflicts in them. It's only conflicts in our like conventional understanding of them. 
And so one way to eliminate conflict is to find the truth of it and figure out the, what is that higher principle between bodily autonomy and the common good that would allow you to select between them. Well, yeah, and, you know, bring that up, Andrew. It makes me remember that, you know, when I was in college, you know, and when I was learning classical philosophy, you know, the moderns are always like, well, we don't we don't need, you know, ancient philosophy and, and we'll just treat these things as self-evident. But the assumption of the self-evident nature of the quote unquote truths of the Enlightenment are, as we figure out, not entirely self-evident at all. And that the actual hard work of trying to uh, balance between competing goods in a hierarchy value, which the moderns thought they could just dispense with, uh, turns out you can't. And it turns out that, you know, Plato and Aristotle and Socrates are all a lot more relevant today in the problems we're dealing with than, you know, the, the hubris of the moderns would have thought. Uh, Logo. Yeah, and another good, really good example of this that that cuts back to a conversation you might remember us having, Todd, is uh, utilitarianism. Right? We were we were discussing something with utilitarians a while back on some Discord server, and um, it was it was really interesting because we were talking about um, how a utilitarian would solve a political dispute between something like, um, uh, let's say, like female independence on one hand and single parent households on the other hand vis-a-vis -vis welfare right so utilitarian would say like we have to maximize the good you know use research to figure out you know what will maximize the good but as you're trying to point out the utilitarian like what is the good that's trying to be maximized are we trying to maximize like autonomy are we trying to maximize uh fa cohesive family uh family units right um and if you don't know the answer to that question all the data in the world isn't going to help you and this is actually really fun because this is something that Immanuel Kant would later bring up more formally. Uh, data does not provide its own interpretation. And so, you know, you can't use a word, a category like justice to just like put the nail on what you're doing. You can't use data and say, here's the data. Therefore, what I'm doing is good or whatnot. Uh, so I think, I think uh, as Andrew likes to point out, platonic dialogues have kind of a really, really good negative space, right? You can't appeal to primitives in nature to tell you what you're going to do. And you can't appeal to just abstract categories themselves to tell you what you're going to do or if what you're doing is right or whatnot. There has to be some like in-between space that Plato's trying to set up for the, the audience to help everybody navigate that will figure this out. Both things are useful, right? Uh, we ride horses, not roses, right? There are animals that can be ridden. We know this from experience. And so when we appeal to our concepts, we should make reference to our experience. And also, when we make reference to our experience, we should fear, you know, appeal to our, our concepts. Um, but, you know, how, how do you put them both together in a way that actually makes sense? And, you know, I'm just, you know, echoing your point here that modern philosophy does not seem to have that figured out whatsoever. Okay, Andrew. Yeah, and I think part of the reason modern philosophy doesn't is I think it actually might be something that is either extremely difficult or impossible to actually articulate explicitly. And that this negative space thing is pro might be the best that we're able to do in language. All right. Well, I think we were about done with the content. Is there anything you'd like to end with logos? Uh, no, this is part one. I was a little behind this week trying to, you know, put a framework together just to read this argument and figure out what's what and how it's going to make sense of it. I will do much better next week. So have some more explicit stuff in the arguments like I have with the Fado. I can't wait to dig into it. But hopefully what we've been able to talk about here is kind of set the stage for the audience in terms of like why this dialogue is important, some of the things that are at stake and all that good stuff. So. All right, Andrew. Yeah, um, all I have to say is uh, this has been probably my favorite dialogue so far. Um, and I love how we're able to tie this to like epistemology and social issues and and all these other things as well. So, All right. Well, thanks again, Logos and Andrew. This is Todd Lewis of the Praise of Fly podcast. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Signing off.